amazing professor, but he cares about the person behind who's, who's, who's a student in, in his classroom. And I, I, I will, will forever be grateful for the time that he took and invested in me. Thank you. So, uh, and thank you for having me here today. So hopefully um, we're gonna just, I'll just talk about a lot of what the TGC is doing. There's a marketing concept that I learned at this university, and it's called uh, the moment of truth. And I don't know if you, you, you use that, that term yourselves, but the concept is, is actually means that when a customer interacts with a brand, and that brand makes an impression on that customer, and it really forms the basis by which that customer will think about that brand going forward. So imagine if transit is the brand. What's your moment of truth when it comes to transit? For me, I have uh, many moments of truth when it comes to transit. One of my moments of truth, um, I think, was when I'm, I was born in the UK, and so I remember being about eight years old and my, um, my parents said I could go on the bus by myself and take my sister to church. Now, this wasn't a long trip, it was like three, three or four bus stops, but that was a big deal for me. And it enabled me just to be able to travel with my sister to church and back. And I remember feeling the freedom and the confidence of what that meant. And I felt safe. So now fast forward, 20 years later, I'm in Toronto, I'm going to uh, this institution, and I'm a young mom, and I have a two-year-old. And I have a very different experience with transit. I have to actually think about which stations, which subway stations I can actually use. Because at that time, not every subway station had an elevator or an escalator that they could use. And the feeling that I felt as a young mom, so I'm a young mom, I'm really stressed. Mm -hmm. I'm a student in my master's program in an area that I think is above my head, so I'm really stressed. And then my interaction with the, the transit system is one that it wasn't for me. It didn't accommodate me. It didn't accommodate my child. And it just made me feel that stress level then went up. So I kind of want to, to kind of talk to you today about really what we are doing at the TTC to kind of ensure that when everybody else is having that moment of truth with the Toronto Transit Commission, it's a positive one. And what, what does that mean? That what, we do, what, we, what do we have to do to kind of really help our customers have that positive experience? So for those who don't know, um, the city of Toronto is the fourth most populated city in North America. And we're home to a very diverse population of around 2.8 million people. And that means that our people from all walks of life. 51% of our population is a visible minority. And two, over 200 languages are spoken in the city. More than 45% of our residents um, have a mother tongue other than English and French. So going back to that moment of truth, everybody's coming from different places with a different idea about transit. But, and we, so we all have something in common. We all need to move around our city. We all need to be able to get to work in places of education. And we have all have a very different expectation around what transit can deliver for us. So although we have different needs and we all need to move around our city, I'm gonna show you a video from 2004 about the people who choose to take transit and the people who have to take transit.
19, 2003, when a massive blackout hit East and Central Canada and the U.S. It happened on a Thursday afternoon at the end of the workday. In cities like Toronto that depend on public transit, the result was chaos. Almost a million people had to find another way home from work. And until the buses, trains, and streetcars started running again, many stayed home at a heavy cost for the economy in Ontario's heartland. It was a sharp reminder of how important public transit is to the greater Toronto area, Canada's largest and fastest growing city region, covering 7,170 square kilometers and home to more than 5 million people. Every day, the tide of city life moves in and out by local transit, and approximately 90% of all those local transit trips in the GTA, almost 1.4 million rides a day, are made on just one system, the TTC. If you include the regional commuter system Go Transit, the TTC still carries over 80%. That's almost 1.4 million riders every day close to 8 million a week, more than 400 million trips per year, 1 billion riders every 30 months. The TTC is a vast, quick-moving river of people, students, seniors, disabled citizens, workers on the way to and from their jobs. Each year, fully 81% of Toronto residents use the TTC. About a quarter of these riders don't have a car, and for them, the TTC is a vital, essential link to the places they need to go. The people bring life to the city, and the TTC keeps them moving, taking workers to the jobs that underpin the economy, making it possible for Toronto to generate more than $15 billion each year in taxes for the province alone, and $20 billion in taxes for Canada. Toronto is the economic engine of Canada, and the TTC is the wheels that keep it moving. Thank you. So this video really helped inspire why I decided to go into transportation and transit. I saw this video just before I started at the university, and uh, or just afterwards at this at, at around the same time, and it was it was a stark reminder to me that, that there's a conflict between my moment of truth as an eight-year-old and then my moment of truth in my 20s as a young mother. And, there, and that, that experience is also very common for many people. So I just, yeah, so as, as, so as I was thinking of, okay, what do I wanna share with you? I wanted to kind of surround it in this conversation because I think it's important for us as, leaders, as planners, as engineers, to ensure that we're not building transit as a consolation prize for people, that it is a first choice for them. So, I need you to help me as I do this presentation. My former boss, Kathleen Llewellyn Thomas, um, once said that we need to have customer at the center of everything that we do. And she challenged us as uh, department heads and as leaders within the, uh, the TTC to make sure that every report we wrote, customer has to be um, uh, mentioned many times in a sentence. Every presentation that we do, the customer has to be the, at the center of it. So I want you to help me with this presentation because I, I want to make sure that I'm actually being accountable um, and ensuring that customer is at the center. So you have bingo cards in front of you. So I want you to play along with me. And when you hear the words that are mentioned in my presentation, um, check off those words and cry out bingo once you have a full card. And I, I, honestly, I, we don't have prizes for everyone because this is a TTC. <laughs> so we have nine prizes. Um, and so if you uh, could play along with us, uh, at least that way I know that I'm on track in terms of ensuring that customer is at the center of what we're doing. Let's see if I can get back. Thank you. So in last year, uh, last September, we began our celebration of our centennial year. 
For over a hundred years, the TTC has held an important role to move people um, across and around our city. To do that, the TTC operates an integrated multimodal transit network that provides our uh, residents with transit service to about 90% of our population and employment within 400 meters or a five minute walk, seven days a week. We also have a very unique system in the city of Toronto, which is our free body transfer, which means that you don't have to pay separately um, for a different mode. You can actually transfer from bus to subway to streetcar or on a single fare. So in Toronto, we have four subway lines, and, and these lines operate in their own right of way, typically below ground, but there are sections of line one and line two that are at ground level. Um, the subway is the spine of our trans transit network, and we plan our services to maximize connections between our service transit routes and the subway to allow for long distance trips. The red lines that I've just added to this, this map are, represent our streetcar routes. And these routes are typically are downtown and they operate um, with other traffic. However, there are three routes that operate in their own right of way. And we have a total of 11 streetcar routes. The remaining lines that I've added to this map are our 160 bus routes and they operate um, in uh, mixed traffic. All of this combines um, these routes um, to provide 9.7 million service hours um, in 2019, serving about 526 million customer, customer trips. And um, they all started and ended at over 10,300 stops and stations. So the department that uh, Eric introduced me that I head up is Strategy and Foresight. And it's a new department, it's only about uh, two years old. And it was designed to be responsible for bringing vision, direction, and strategy into the TTC, which had been um, absent for many decades. And also ensuring that we are building for those uncertain futures, like the pandemic that we've just experienced. At the end of 2019, uh, we got our first ever five-year service plan approved by our board. And this has been the blueprint for our service needs between 2020 and 2024. It's designed around five pillars of opportunity, and our uh, five-year service plan seeks to really improve the customer experience. Oh, we've got bingo already? Wow. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Excellent. We need to fact check this. Yeah. <laughs> that's good, because I'm, I'm on your slide nine, and we still have a lot to go through. That's excellent. Wonderful. So our five-year service plan has five pillars of opportunity, and it's really designed to around the entire customer experience. So from the beginning of where our customer plans their journey, to when they get on to our system, to when they're waiting on our bus stops, to at the end of their ride. So it's really trying to look at a comprehensive customer experience. I don't know, unfortunately, unfortunately, as soon as we published this in 2019, we actually went into that pandemic. And this really upended not only globally about how we move around, and I know that you're all familiar with that, but it really drastically changed how we um, manage and operate transit. The most notable change was that millions of people who live and work in this city decided that uh, through um, health regulations that they have to work at home. And that changed really the patterns that we saw on transit. This picture here shows uh, one of our busiest intersections in the city. Young and Wharf. And typically, this is bustling with all modes of, uh, of transportation. But as you can see, this was taken in April 2020, and it's, it's empty. 
So during the pandemic, we saw employers switch to remote work, students switch to remote learning, and people and destinations such as a big events and restaurants really, you know, closed down. At the same time, we saw millions of people who were our essential workers still have to go to work. We still have to keep our hospitals open, long-term care facilities open, manufacturing, schools, all these other places that we still had to keep, we had to manage, had to stay open. And people needed to take transit to get to those places. So like many agencies, the TTC experienced a, a sharp decline in ridership, which forced us to quickly respond to the change in ridership patterns over the last two and a half years. So this map shows our ridership beginning um, in January 2020. And as you can see, with every vertical line that you see here represents a different stage of the lockdown and, and requirements that we have to, healthcare requirements that we all have to abide by. And you can see the shift in, um, in our uh, ridership. What you can see here is that the, the bus, which is going to be the story of, I think, of, 20, of, of the entire two and a half years, continues to be the primary mode of where, where most people were traveling, but it is dramatic. And what I want to point out here is why this matters so much to us is that the funding requirements that we have in Canada for transit is very different than other, um, other countries and other agencies. We relied before the pandemic on our um, fare box revenue to really sustain our system. 62% of our revenue came from the fare box. So this shift matters to us because how do we fund it? How do we fund our transit system? How do we continue to get people to, to ensure that we have the service that people need even though our ridership has um, drastically changed? So to serve our customers and um, their evolving needs and what we saw happening in that, that previous graph is that we had um, a, a client that had two principles. The first, so this was to, to ensure that we had a, a more agile and demand responsive plan so we can ensure that we have service where, people, where it matters the most. So the first was to, principle was to schedule re regular service and focus on protecting high ridership corridors and service to essential employment areas like grocery stores, pharmacies, healthcare facilities, and our neighborhood improvement areas. So these are areas in the city that have been typically underserved, underserved by um, investment. So these are places that don't have access to a lot of amenities. And we continue to provide in all the other areas in the city, at least a 30 minute or better uh, transit service. The second principle that we employed was to have a fleet of dedicated flexible buses that we could then deploy where the growth and where the demand was happening. So that really helped us to ensure that the people who needed our service the most actually got the, the transit service they needed. So while many of our daily activities returned, we did see a very, we still see a very slow return uh, for people going back to the office. Um, and this graph really shows us really what's happening um, with, within our transit system. So I'm gonna just walk you through it. So um, the, what you see the light blue is what our ridership looked like in 2019, right? And the peaks that you see there are the typical peak hours that have um, that we've always had, and then what you see in the very dark blue is uh, is what happened in 2020. So that's really the worst, the height of the pandemic, and the height of all of the um, healthcare restrictions that we had on us. The, um, the the medium blue there is what you see is the recovery that is happening um, in 2021. So as you can see by this graph, what we're seeing is 
we're not quite where we were in, 20, in 2019. Um, but what's also happening here is that there is a more of a flattening of the off-peak. So more people are returning during the off-peak. So um, I will just switch to looking at the profile for bus. So throughout the pandemic, we saw that ridership has recovered and our, much, and, and our bus network has recovered much faster than our streetcar and our subway. So when you think about our network, the streetcars move people um, around the downtown, the subways move people towards the downtown, but the buses are doing something very different. They're moving people across our city. And when you look at where the most vulnerable people are in the city of Toronto, they are in the, what we call in the suburbs, which are not in the downtown. And so the buses of what we've learned are really the workhorse of our entire system. So another key lessons that we've learned throughout this pandemic um, together with um, all of what you've probably seen is um, a lot of the social inequalities that are happening in and around our city. And this awareness of equity is really here to stay for, for us. So we've been doing a deep dive into the trends and we've observed over the last two and a half years um, that there are key customer segments that um, continue to rely on transit. And these are people with low income, shift workers, and women. Is that another bingo? I, I have one too. Oh, we have another, we have another bingo here and, and see the front. Okay. Uh, am okay. I allowed to win? Can, am I allowed to? Yes, you're allowed. You're allowed. Yes, you're allowed. Really paying attention. Excellent. <laughs> Prizes we have. <laughs> My prize is riding the PPC. Okay. Oh, nice, nice. Okay, are we out of prizes? No. Okay, so we have. Uh, oh, I have a bingo. Oh, excellent. I think Steve had one too. Annual transit pass. Oh, there's a bingo down here. Oh, okay. 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 Okay.
So just to give you some perspective, um, the uh, living wage in Toronto is about $46,000 a year. And if you wanted to buy a house, a semi-detached house in Toronto, you have, are lucky to spend at least $1.1 million. And I'm sure people are saying that's not true, and Joel has got higher than that now, but that's, that's, that's give you some sort of scale as to what that means um, to have this many people who are low income on your system. Spatially, the, um, many of the low income jobs are in the periphery of our city. They're not in the downtown. And so that means that most of the low income riders are actually using our bus network. So these, these um, low income uh, riders won't be affected by any of the policy changes that we see when we talk about hybrid work models because they continue to rely on our transit system. Now let's talk about the shift workers. So these are essential um, uh, workers who work in places such as hospitals, long-term care facilities, um, they work on construction sites, they work in grocery stores, manufacturing, and these are the work that continue to happen even while many of us got the opportunity to work from home. So um, shift workers have to work, um, have to access the, uh, the transit system in, in off-peak times and 24 hours a day. So, and, and many of the essential jobs are not, not necessarily concentrated in the downtown. They too are like spatially distributed around our city. And because of the nature of their employment, shift workers are likely to rely on off-peak service. Um, and they use the bus network um, a lot more than other modes. Again, it won't matter what we do in terms of policies such as hybrid work models for this category of our customer because they will continue to rely on transit. So let's talk about women. In 2021, 55% um, of our customers were women. And in late January 2022, that climbed to 57%. And so we have, and, and most of the women on our right, are, that are on our system are doing trip chains, and they're, they're making multiple trips on a single ride. They're getting off to grocery shop or other things. Um, women are also um, more likely to run personal errands. Uh, when compared to men, um, women, uh, the share of commuting trips are around 39% compared to 45%. Oh, it's not bingo. Great. So women continue to rely heavily on our transit system throughout the pandemic. And as a result, they, many of them travel off peak and during the midday for many reasons. And, and we also heard that for many women, it is about safety and the perceived um, um, uh, safety issues um, that might happen um, at night or um, and other times of the day, that's why they are traveling um, during the, the day or midday. And again, it won't matter whether or not we have any policies around hybrid work models. These, um, this particular customer group uh, will rely on heavily on transit. So for each of these groups uh, that rely uh, on transit, and particularly they rely on our bus network, we provided more frequent bus service across all corners of our cities um, so that we can ensure that we can speed travel times around, this, around the city. So to help speed up these trips, we have been exploring and implementing new bus treatments. And what you see here is what we implemented in 2020, which is um, a, a priority bus route on one of our corridors in the city. And this is on Angleton West. And we, it's been quite transformative. So this bus lane actually serves buses and um, bicycles. And we've been able to dramatically reduce um, uh, the travel times for our buses on this network. And this was uh, a key element of our five-year service plan. And we are, we've identified more corridors that we want to do this treatment on. So another way that we can improve transit for these three customer groups is to have policies and standards that really help um, their travel needs. 
So over the course of the pandemic, the TTC has relied, um, has, has maintained high levels of service due to these policies and standards that we already had in place. So I'm gonna walk you through a few of the, the policies that we had established. So one of the first things we had was an all day, every day network. And this provides a high level of off-peak service. So that ensures that regardless of when you travel, you're gonna have access to um, a really good network. We have a very extensive express bus network uh, which provides a faster travel if you're going long distance. So again, you know, you know, capturing those shift workers and low income who are traveling across our city, the express network is really quite important for them to achieve, um, to move around the city. We have a blue light network that provides an overnight service um, to everyone who, who needs to get access to our service at any hour. We have a 10 minute network that provides frequent service all day um, to, on a set of core routes, including off peak routes. And then we have a, a grid design that provides service to meet the majority of potential origins and destinations. We also have an off-peak crowding standard. And this is really designed so that if you're traveling off-peak, we have uh, ensured that we are um, having less, uh, we have less crowding standards, we have an increased crowding standard so that we can ensure there's less people on certain vehicles so that we can accommodate strollers and larger items. We've also maintained fair policies and initiatives that uh, were already in place to support our customers. So in, in terms of our fair policies, in 2017, we initiated a two hour transfer. And uh, that meant that people can travel uh, on a single fare for two hours and not, ha and they can get off and go to, uh, you know, get something at a grocery store or anything and then come back. In the case of my mom, who loves the two-hour transfer, she's a senior, she actually will make sure she can go to a, an appointment and come back within that two hours. So she's really monopolizing that, the two-hour transfer. It has been a game changer. And the two-hour transfer has really changed even the way in which our customers purchase products. So we've seen a dramatic shift in um, people buying less product, less um, monthly passes, because they're able to capitalize on this two hour transfer. As I mentioned before, what's very unique about our system is that we have a flat fare, we don't have, it's not fair by distance, and it actually is, uh, allows us to transfer between uh, different modes, which also is very unique. We also have a program that kids under 12 can ride free. So that also really has impacted and helped um, all families that have, um, um, have children. And it's something that um, other agencies that are connected to our, uh, our region have also employed. The city has a program that's designed to help low income residents. So people who are receiving um, a government subsidy now have access to what we call the Fair Pass program. And this, is, this gets a substantive discount to our, um, our transit system. And so we've provided the, the means for um, residents to be able to have access to this and it helps people who are low income. And we've also distributed um, Presto cards. So I know some of you who shouted bingo right now may have received a Presto card. And you might be saying, yeah, you might be saying to yourself, what's the big deal? Well, the Presto card, there is a fee that's associated with that. When you, when you first get a Presto card, you're gonna have to pay $6. And, uh, and that's just because, you know, there's the cost of um, producing that, that card. For people who are low income, 
or you do, if you have a, a large family, whatever your situation is, that six dollars can be a barrier for you. And so what we did at the TTC is we purchased um, a lot of these cards ourselves directly from um, the agency that manages Presto. And we have ensured that if, if you're low income, you can go to one of the libraries, one of the many libraries in the city of Toronto, and, have, and actually put, get a, a free card from us. So we want to make sure that that, that $6 is not a barrier for you. Another thing that we've done um, to ensure that we reduce those barriers is that there used to be a minimum uh, fee that you have to put on your Presto card. And we've worked with the province to ensure that there isn't a minimum fee anymore. So again, that's a, a way that we can remove barriers. Easier access. Uh, this is a program um, we have a legislation here in Ontario called the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. And this is a, a list of initiatives and requirements that we, physical requirements that we have to put in place to ensure that everybody has access to buildings and everyone has full access to our transportation system. And that story that I told in the beginning about my experience um, at the TTC 20 years ago in having to make decisions around which stations I could use because not all stations had an elevator is that was just my you know snapshot in time and that was my issue we needed to do something even more for people who had disabilities and so we've been spending the last 20 plus years ensuring that every station has access to an elevator or two. And I think we're only down to about well, a handful of stations now, um, I think less than like four stations or so that don't have this kind of um, amenity. Um, and that's really important, right? So ensuring that everyone can use our system. This is really important because even though we provide a paratransit service for people who have disabilities, our conventional services I just showed you is extensive. And if we can have, make sure that is fully accessible, then we're given access to everyone to get to, to be able to reach where they want to go at any time of the day um, to our system. Bus stop amenities. So when you think about those three customer segments, you need to think about, you know, do we have the right lining? Do we have shelters in place? And do we have seating available? And that's another program that we're working on. Request a stop program. So many of you may not know this, but if you are traveling after 9 p.m., you can actually request where you're driving, where the bus stop uh, driver actually drops you off. So it doesn't have to be at that designated stop. It can be between stops. And that's to re-ensure that you know, if you don't feel safe, that we can drop you in the place that, that is safe for you. We have designated waiting areas. And so that is, if you, if you notice that, um, where that, that sign is, every station in our system has a designated safe, uh, waiting area. There's um, call buttons in that location, there's better lighting in that location, Often there's a telephone in that location, and that really is to make sure that all of our most vulnerable customers feel safe. So during the pandemic, we implemented real-time crowd-in information for our bus network, which really provides information to our customers about the current level of crowding on the next bus. So we wanted to give our customers the choice of whether or not they felt comfortable to go on um, an, an upcoming bus. So that if they saw the crowding levels were too high, they could then um, opt to go for the next bus. So we're really empowering our customers on better um, information. So that's a lot of policies, right? So I've given you a lot of an idea of um, what we had previously what we've learned throughout the whole pandemic. Um, and and, and so, yeah, so it's a lot of things that we were doing right and a lot of things that we've learned through this pandemic. So it's not enough for us though. 
right? Because what I showed you, that, that book, that video in 2004, already established that we knew we had some people who were on our system that were shift workers, that were primarily women, and, and that were low income. What's changed? And so I, I think what's changed is we've changed as an organization, and we want to be able to ensure that the policies and the things going forward are going to really make a difference. So one of the areas of improvement really is how can we better consult with our customers? So we, we need to have more targeted conversations with our customers, and specifically with those, those three customer segments. So, and we started having those conversations. So last week we've been hosting a series of focus groups with the low income shift workers and women. And we've been hearing some really insightful things. We've heard from women that they avoid traveling at nighttime. They dislike crowding and um, they want to have a 10 minute frequent service. People of low income have told us they want to make fewer transfers. And shift workers have told us that they would like to have that express service be available to us, to them, um, during um, the weekends. So all three, three of those groups have commented on the need for better reliable service, safety, and much better communications. We've also, um, actually even before the pandemic, started a program that we call Youth Ambassadors. Because, and I think it's the same for any kind of level of engagement that you have, even throughout the city, is that it's been always very difficult for us to reach um, hard to reach neighborhoods, marginalized groups. So how do we get the feedback so that we can be better as an organization? So we had this program with youth ambassadors. The youth from, um, from different neighborhood uh, improvement areas, we pay them to give us feedback about what's happening and then they engage with their community. And that's something that I think has, has really established um, a longer relationship with, with, our, with various different communities. And it's also um, really given us a lot more insightful information about what matters the most to our communities. We also need to look at data. So, um, and thankfully we're not starting from scratch. We've been collecting data on gender and occupation and income data. Um, but and we've had really good partnerships with the, with the University of Toronto. We've been using great data sources that this, this institution has provided for, for decades. But we're challenging that data. You know? So we've had different conversations with, with, um, with the university about how can we collect race-based data? How can we make sure that, so we can uh, begin to really understand our, our customers better, right? So that we can then make um, really the changes that, that what we, we've heard about. It also means that we have to, um, to, to collect data and analyze and race-based data, data, gender, income, occupation, and, and actually use this information in not just the way that we provide service changes, so it's not just the, you know, the, the frequency of service and, and, and things like express bus routes. It's also the way that we design our services and design our, our facilities. So you know, how can we ensure that we have washrooms where we need to have washrooms? How can we ensure that, that new train designs and new bus designs really meet the needs of women, really meet the needs of, the low, of low income uh, of, of low-income um, customers. And that's been a challenge for us. So one of the ways that, that my team is working on is really working on ensuring that we um, can better standardize the way in which we design our facilities. So as we begin planning beyond uh, the COVID pandemic, we're using all of these learnings that we've observed for the last two and a half years uh, to really optimize and develop a better five-year service plan. So we've started that work already. 
And, that, uh, and so we're gonna do some additional work to review our service levels. We're gonna also look at ways that we can support travel behaviors for the low income shift workers and, and women. We're gonna conduct better research um, on understanding the impacts of this hybrid work model um, to our own ridership and to our customers. Um, we're also going to continue to review our existing standards, but also challenge ourselves um, to, to do things for, um, to increase equity within our system. We're going to continue to leverage um, what we know through our customer satisfaction surveys. Um, and we are going to uh, also optimize uh, our, a new uh, panel that we just developed uh, within the last two years. So this is a customer panels. So we have access to people who have decided that they want to provide feedback to us at any time. And so we're going to optimize these customer panels that we have uh, just started. So all that is to say that even though we have seen, and I, I want to kind of remind you about that map, the, the graph that showed that drive, you know, shift in our ridership which has really changed the way in which uh, we see ourselves. It's, it's challenged us. So even though we have got support from various different levels of government to get us through the last two and a half years, um, that has been a, a massive shift for us. And so, but I, I, I just, I, I maybe want to just emphasize that we still are optimistic that we can use the learnings of the last two years to really change the way that we do our business. So, you know, no longer seeing those office workers who represented such a huge amount of our trip base and now seeing that shifted over to um, low income and shift workers really has challenged us to do things differently so that we can actually provide a better service to our customers. So going back to what you think your moment of truth is when it comes to transit. When I asked you that question, and I'm sure you had an impression in your mind about what transit means to you, what we're trying to do is to ensure that when our most vulnerable customers interact with transit, it's a really positive experience. It's something that will get them not thinking that they have to use transit, but it is um, something that they get to use and they get to enjoy. Happy to take any questions. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that 52 percent of the budget is used via fare collection. Are you putting those in through our system that allows for that transfer? So you're basically missing out on that revenue stream. No, it was it was a revenue loss, right? So it's as we evolve and think about you know what's better for our customers. So this is a shift, right? You know, um, as we think about better products, we we anticipated that revenue loss, so that was accounted for in um, our overall budget. And, but that's but still, yeah, because we still still are heavily reliant on the fare box, it is more challenging to make other bigger improvements on the fair side because it's still, we're still heavily dependent. So even with that two hour transfer, we're still at 62, we were still at 62%, um, you know, uh, fair box recovery. And we accounted for that loss when we, when we made that, sh that change. The same thing happened when we made the change to kids under 12 ride free. That was a, a, a loss. Right, and so, but we again we have it for it. So it's one of the things that we do when we present that to our board, and, it, and then eventually when it goes to the budget for um, in front of the council, they are fully aware of, of the revenue impacts to making that change. But it, it is challenging. And it's not subsidized whatsoever. It's the the system is subsidized by the city, so by the tax base. So so when we so when you see uh, that we've lost a lot of our ridership. Uh, where we've been able to um, to recoup and still provide the level of service. So we had that demand responsive 
service that we put out during the during the pandemic, which is which is we need to ensure that people weren't impacted by service cards. That was subsidized by the, the federal and, and the provincial governments to, to offset that impact. It, it will definitely help. So I, I think you talk about line five, which is Edwin's in Crosstown. Yeah. So that has been, a, there's been a history, anybody who's been here for a long time, they know there's been a history of that line. It was justified more than 30 years ago because of that reason, because it was, it was it's a line that will, it actually bisects the city, but end to end, it reaches people who live, who are in mostly in our neighborhood improvement areas who don't have access to rapid transit. So if you were to see like that map of our city, uh, somewhere of our whole transit system, the inner core is where we have our rapid, you know, our subway lines and our, and our rapid transit service. You know, you see the streetcar lines of down in the downtown, but the periphery of the city really is void of really a lot of transit or rapid transit. And what the Edmonton uh, Line 5 will do for our, our city is really help um, primarily, you know, people who live in, in neighborhood improvement areas who don't have access to that level of service. It's going to be a game changer, right? So, and, and part of my job is to ensure that the, they still have a great customer experience. My job is to continue to fight to ensure that we have that single fare that will get them on Eglinton, Crosstown, or the Line 5, sorry, I've given all the names, Line 5, and they can get part of the system, right? To ensure that we don't um, segregate, you know, rapid transit lines from other pieces of, of the transit. And that pressure, we're getting every, we, get, we always have that pressure to kind of like um, make our system similar to London and other, in New York, where you pay for a subway ride and separately then you pay for a bus ride. Go ahead, the back. We've got lots of, um, I, I believe that you're saying that, you know, I'll be advocating for free fares for people who might need it the most and access and, or for everyone, for every, everywhere. Um, we have not looked, we, we did look at that. So I just finished a study, um, which was our five year fare policy. And we looked at, um, you know, free fares, zero free fares to full cost, right? Because even the, the cost of the fare today is subsidized. It's not, not being fully paid for what it costs to, to go on the system. Um, and we, um, we, I mean, I guess the equation that we were looking at was if we made everything free, are we going to see a bump in our ridership? And we see a small bump, but not huge. And, that, and, and there's, a, there's a reason for that. The reason why we didn't see a huge bump is because our mode share, and you saw that in that video, even though that was, that was almost 20 years ago, our mode share in Toronto for transit is around 32%, which is, I think is like the, probably the cap of, you know, maybe the cap of where we could achieve when it comes to mode share. And so when we gave 
everyone, you know, got a free fare, we did not see that we substantially increase. That's not to say that we wouldn't look at other opportunities for us to have a better fare system. And so we're working with the city on what we can do for people who are receiving a subsidy from the city and, and seeing how we can improve things on that on that front. The other thing that we're working on is what we call the be like a best fare, so that you know um, we don't have to have people don't have to buy a product to in order for them to get the best savings. That we can automatically at the back end ensure that they get the best value every time that they they use our system. So we're looking at that, but it goes back to that first question. You know, it, how does it get funded? And I think that's that's the that's the challenge that we have because right now historically. The TTC is always, always, majority of our funds have come from the fair box. So that makes it very challenging. And then the expectation politically is that that would continue. So I think it's, it's you'd have to have a different conversation politically, and maybe that goes to your advocacy question piece, is how can we change that conversation so there's less expectation that our riders are already then paying for the system. person to talk about the that panel in depth I can say it's a little bit more it's more of a imagine a dedicated focus group that you can tap into all the time because typically focus groups you know they're randomized and you talk to these people and then you can't talk to the same person again so this is like a panel of I think is it a thousand um, um, there's a lot of people that have signed up to be part of this panel and then uh, we can then continually reach out to them, not just for the customer satisfaction kind of questions, but beyond that, right? So we can make it specific and just say, okay, can we talk to you about this? I do like the diary idea, because uh, I think that's something that we can do. Sorry? TTS does that. Oh, TTS does that, okay, so that's, yeah, so we, yes. Yeah. I'm curious about the, the speed of the bus network. What happens, you know, the trend we saw the pandemic and then we probably back were going faster or are now what's going on in terms of because I have seen many cities that they have a very hard, you know, very kind of downward trend in terms of the speed, even though with the treatments and they are helping in some areas, but system wide it seems very hard to change the speed of the bus system. So maybe you can comment on what's going on. Yeah, that's a really that's a really great question. So, like I would say, in 2020, sorry, I repeat the question. So, what happened during the pandemic with the speeds of buses? Because our buses are in mixed traffic, you know. So, did they? I'm assuming did they benefit from less traffic, less vehicle traffic being on the road? And what's the what's that conversation? Or what's what's the trend like today? Now that you know we are seeing traffic levels increase, and so we did see that pattern, and and. Um, I think it was it, that this, it's, it's a it was a plus and a minus, right? Um, and I say that because I'm also wearing a, I, that hat of you know having that priority bus lane. So those red bus lanes that you saw a picture of is a initiative that we're working on on really key corridors that traditionally has been very challenging to move our buses through those corridors. So imagine you're having a dialogue with your um, you know, elected officials and your board members, and you're saying we need to do these priority lines in the middle of 2020 when buses are, having, are basically free flow, right? And so it was very difficult for, them, for some people to connect and say, well, that's just temporary. If, you know, we're gonna see traffic return, which we have. And, and, and so what we did last week is when we presented to our board, we actually showed them the numbers. We actually showed them five corridors. The first corridor we showed them was one where we did those bus lane treatments. We showed them what, was, what traffic was like before the pandemic and what traffic was like 
at the peak of the pandemic in 2020 where traffic came down. And then we showed them what, what, what has traffic been like as things have returned. And the only corridor that we've been able to demonstrate that our buses have improved reliability is that corridor that had the priority bus lane treatment. So that's something that we, we can continue to advocate for to say, um, you know, what the traffic patterns that we saw in 2020 were essentially a blip. And, and now vehicle traffic has returned to normal levels. And now we have to go back to the business of prioritizing buses to ensure that we, we um, recapture the right of way again for transit. There's a question behind you. Children are traveling for free. What about elderly? So our seniors do have a discounted rate, and we've had that for some time. Like that's been traditional. I think mean, even after the Second World War, we've had people because the pensioners not having enough income, we've traditionally given seniors a discounted rate. We have had calls though for us to kind of relook at that and provide maybe deeper discounts to our seniors. Um, so that's something that's still on the table. It's mixed because um, if you were to look and, and, and look at all of our seniors, um, some, some of them are our wealthiest residents, right? So providing discounts based on age doesn't necessarily address the need. So what we would like probably to do is more, we should be doing discounts based on your income. Um, maybe where you live. We're looking even at, we've had conversations with some groups within our organization to say, maybe everyone who um, lives in this community, when they get on this bus stop, they don't pay anything. Just because you know the communities have higher needs. So we've, we've looked at that. Go ahead. I, I was wondering, uh, what's your relationship with uh, different sharing systems? Uh, for example, bike sharing systems, uh, scooters, or even Uber. I know that you have a, a very wide network, but I guess that there's also these systems all around the city. So how can you benefit from them instead of competing as, as a service? I don't think from a, like when you talk about active transportation, I don't think there's a competitiveness between ourselves and active transportation. I think we, we, we're actually trying to do measures where you know, there are bike stations um, at, our, at our subway stations, and there are bike racks on all of our buses. Um, and we are actually working on a bike policy right now, um, you know, about, you know, because some of, I think our existing bike policy is a bit wonky, because you can't use, you can't get use your bike on our system during the peak times, which is usually where people want to drive, use their bikes. So we were, we're, working, we're working on a policy that can really kind of connect active transportation better with our transit, because I think they're, they're complementary, they're definitely not competitive. The Uber um, question I think is still out there. I don't, I don't think we have any partnerships right now. I know Go has a partnership with Uber and Lyft, um, and, and I think that's something we can explore. Um, but on that whole ride hailing question, um, our board has actually asked us to look at the impact of ride hailing to transit and, and to kind of examine whether or not um, the, you know, the actual popularity of these ride hailing apps has, you know, negatively um, impacted, you know, our business. And what does that say? Again, it would be a conversation that we need to have with our customers to kind of like find out their preferences, right, and then work with uh, and see if there's an opportunity to partner if, if there is. Uh, yeah, thank you for, for the presentation. Um, you showed a lot of different uh, programs, and one of them was the dedicated uh, bus lane. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I assume that that increases the, the accessibility of, of the users. So mm -hmm. the, the uh, now, do you also have a program uh, which tries to align the public transport system with the freight transport system and the accessibility of so uh, are we aligning the freight transportation system with the public transportation system? Yeah, and especially during peak hours, for example. It's often inevitable transport, can it be used for all the Oh, so the, the, okay. I, 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 I couldn't say we're not doing that. 
Um, that's something that we have a regional body um, called Metrolink. And they are, they actually are designed to look at integration of various different trans, transit systems. Because we're, we're you know, governing the city, but around our city, there's another 2. Point, almost 3 million people that are, are coming into our city. And there's various different individual transit systems um, that are managed separately. And then we have a larger body called Metrolinks, which is, which is trying to coordinate all of those systems, including looking at freight and opportunities to um, you know, optimize how freight is moved within the city. Right, so you know, I think that's a question that I think this, our, my colleagues at the City of Toronto will be working on. So that's likely that we're working on. So a lot of us in the conference have been doing accessibility analysis and modeling, trying to understand how public transport helps to get people access to opportunities they want to. And I was wondering to what extent you guys at TTC are using some level of accessibility measure to guide the goals of how you design your transit policy? And if not, what barriers do you, do you guys have that perhaps some people in this room could help you uh, overcome? I hope you could overcome, help you overcome some of our barriers. I think we, we do have, actually we're, we're, develop, we're in the process of working, I think we were, there was an accessibility study that I think he reached out to us about, that we, uh, um, Steve reached out to us about looking at that. Um, so we, we do have accessibility measures that we, we put in place. We have standards that ensure that we want to be able to have people, as I say, that five minute walk standard is, is, a, is a key metric that we use to ensure that we're providing the level of service that our, our residents need. So that's one key uh, accessibility metric that we're using. I think we're open to other metrics that we should be using um, that, so that we can increase that level of access. Is there other metrics that? No, I think it's just like working on that mobilizing justice project will also help us identify different policies that can help address that. Mm -hmm. yeah. One more. We have one more question. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, the uh, presentation. So, regarding a couple of questions in this one as well, because we talked about like student driven decision making and also using the data that you have. Is there a, a program or platform that TTC opens up with its data sets such as Verizon and PATH uh, for the general public and for other institutes more than your collaborator collaborates with us to work on so that we can provide maybe more data sets? It's actually a very timely question. We, we are uh, working, uh, I have a colleague who's working on an open data policy so that we can, well, I, we actually do share our data right now with the city. There is an open data website that you, sh that you will be able to see um, some of our data that's available there. But we are working on um, a policy so that we can just understand like the parameters of, of what that could look like. Uh, but yeah, definitely, I, I think um, sharing our data is something that I think we will be able to, um, you know, capture what others can do with that data, and then we can learn ourselves. So we're very transparent in that way. So if you want to be able to connect with us, and uh, I think we're happy to share that information. Well, please join me in thanking Angela again for a brilliant keynote. <laughs>